So now we're going to talk about respiratory systems and the way that those differ, and these definitely are going to differ quite a bit. Um, so we're going to start out with the gills, and that you find those in aquatic vertebrates, definitely in fish. And um, what these guys have is, you, if you look at this, is they've got these um, gills that are set up. If you remember from any dissections we've done, you can see that the gills look very feathery. And the reason they do is they're these finger-like projections called filaments, and they are lined with capillaries. And what happens is the fish is going to open its mouth, and then the um, oxygen-rich water is going to flow over the gills, and it's actually going to diffuse all of that oxygen into the blood. Um, gills are very, very, very efficient at getting oxygen out of water. Very, very, very efficient. Now, some fish are going to have this thing called an operculum, which is a bony plate. So if you've ever seen like a goldfish and it's doing this, um, that's the operculum that it's opening. And what happens is they can actually, it's a, it's a nice advantage to have, they can actually stay still and keep breathing because what they can do is just kind of do this and with their mouth open, it's going to pull water over their gills. Now, sharks are not as lucky because they don't have an operculum. So sharks are what we call ram ventilators. And what that means is they have to swim with their mouth open to push the water over their gills. So if they stop swimming for an extended period of time, they could have a potential to drown. Okay, uh, back to our notes. We talked about that. Um, the next one are going to be amphibians. So if you think about... Um, amphibians like frogs and that type of thing and they have a really interesting way of um, doing respiration so what they're going to do you've ever seen a frog and it goes burp and it has that big kind of bubble that forms under its chin that's part of its breathing process so they don't have the capacity even though they have lungs right here they don't have the capacity to expand their thoracic cage to do that so what they do is they actually are going to block off the um, continuation from their mouth to their lungs and then they're going to breathe in with the nostrils and they're going to blow up that buccal cavity so that kind of bubble under their chin then what they're going to do is actually close off their nostrils squeeze that buccal cavity and that's going to shove air into their lungs so it's a two-part process that is not very efficient so they don't have a very efficient heart and they don't have very efficient lungs but they're making it um, they are going to supplement this process with what's called cutaneous respiration, which is where they're going to breathe through their skin. So it, a lot of people think they strictly breathe through their skin, but it's not the case. They supplement their breathing through their skin. Um, then, what was the last one I thought I saw? Oh, reptiles. Um, so reptiles are going to be a little more advanced, A, because their hearts are a little bit better um, set up with that partial wall, but also because they actually can do thoracic breathing. So they can expand and contract the rib cage to open their lungs up and close their lungs. Now, if we talk about mammals in particular, um, that was that next picture I was showing, and that's going to be this one. And so what we can do is we can breathe in through our nose or our mouth, goes into our um, pharynx, and then it's going to eventually go into our um, bronchial tubes, right? And those are going to lead to our lungs, and in our lungs we have the alveoli, which are going to be these grape-like clusters, and those are going to have um, capillaries surrounding them, and that's how they're going to actually um, do the gas exchange that we do. Now, we have a diaphragm. That's going to help. It can pull down and open our lungs up. And then we have our intercostal muscles and our thoracic cage that can help to open up as well. So that's how that works. Um, the last one is going to be birds, and birds are going to be crazy. So we've already talked about how awesome they are and just these crazy advantages that they have. But um, if you look at this picture, this can kind of show you the way that they work. They never mix oxygen-rich and oxygen-poor um, air coming into them. So they have little air um, pockets, and what they can do is they can breathe in that oxygen-rich one into this posterior air sac. Then what they can do is actually contract that posterior air sac into the lungs, and now you've got that... Um, oxygen poor air and then they can push it out so they don't ever have it's kind of like this one-way flow where they don't have any oxygen rich and oxygen poor air mixing so it's a very very um, advanced setup and it's because flying is so metabolically expensive for them to do so um, I think that is super cool um, so the last little part here is just talking about different ways we can measure our breathing. Um, so one of them is going to be what's called tidal volume, and that's going to be how much air you're breathing in and breathing out with every normal breath that you do. Then you've got your inspiratory reserve volume. And so if I say, you know, just do a regular breath in and then breathe in as much as you can after that, that's called an inspiratory reserve. 
Same thing with expiratory reserve. That's, you know, just do a regular exhale. And then there's a lot more that you can exhale after that. And that's called your ex, ex, bleh, expiratory reserve volume. Um, now, there is going to be something called residual volume. And what that's going to be is after you do your expiratory reserve, so like you breathe out, you breathe out as much as you can, that um, residual volume is going to be a little bit of air that's left in your lungs and in your um, bronchial tubes, and that's to keep everything from collapsing. So obviously that's super important. And then the last thing here is um, really important if you're going to any medical field whatsoever is understanding how oxygen and carbon dioxide affect your blood. So um, if you have high levels of carbon dioxide in your blood, it's going to make your blood more acidic. If you have high oxygen levels in your blood, it's going to make it more basis, basic. So um, acidosis and alkalosis are going to be effects that can happen from that, and those are going to be very serious issues that you can have from hyper or hypoventilating. But that's a really important um, situation to think about. And that's it. Enjoy.